Hello and welcome to Mr. Valentin's YouTube video for the review of the Canterbury Tales. I figured rather than bombard you with every character in an extremely long podcast, I thought it would be more beneficial for us to break down half of the characters. So this podcast reviews everything from the beginning of the prologue all the way through The Wife of Bath. So, the Canterbury Tales. Uh, the first up thing we need to know is our author, Geoffrey Chaucer. Until this point, none of our books have had an author, so it becomes that much more vital that Geoffrey Chaucer is an author. Uh, he was the son of a merchant, page in a royal house, soldier, diplomat, and royal clerk. Uh, he saw quite a bit of the medieval world. His varied experiences helped prepare him to write. The Canterbury Tales. This writing was originally in what is known as Middle English, which we've been practicing in class. Middle English is a language that almost seems foreign to us. There was a vowel shift, things didn't sound the way they were, different words were used, um, stresses were used in different ways, uh, different sounds were produced. And so it, it feels very much like a foreign concept. Uh, Geoffrey Chaucer's birth year all right, is approximately 1343. There's some debate about that. Um, but there is record of his death, which is 1400. All right, that means this literature is 14th century British literature. Chaucer did write the Canterbury Tales in his later years. No one knows for certain what prompted him to begin this work. His inspiration may have been from his own participation in his pilgrimage to Canterbury, but there's not 100% proof of that. Of the projected 120 stories, only 24 were complete. So out of possible 120, only 24 were complete. The work still stands as a complete work, but it's still often regarded as an incomplete work. But you can read all 24 and construct a story within it. Uh, he is regarded as the father of English poetry. In his own lifetime, Geoffrey Chaucer was considered one of the greatest English poets. Recognized as a sh shrewd storyteller, he was also praised by contemporaries as the first to rain, quote, rain the gold dewdrops of speech and eloquence into English literature, end quote. Throughout history, a new generation of poets' writings in English have studied his work for inspiration and insight. So that's what we need to know about Geoffrey Chaucer. Let's continue. Our text is unique because it's what is known as a social commentary. Uh, social commentary is writing that offers insight into society, its values, and its customs. All right, so, again, emphasize society, its values, and customs. This becomes important because that means our text is saying something. Something about the characters we meet something about the world that they live in, something about Geoffrey Chaucer's world. So the idea of social commentary is it's saying something. Uh, the two big literary terms that we're going to cover for this podcast or YouTube video is direct characterization and indirect characterization. Direct characterization is very simple. Uh, it presents direct statements about a character. So when... Geoffrey Chaucer makes a statement about the knight that he followed chivalry, truth, honor, he's an honorable person, or the squire when he says he's about 20 years old, he has uh, blonde locks. That's direct characterization because we're saying something direct about the character. It requires very little to no interpretation. Indirect characterization, however, is the opposite. Indirect 
characterization uses actions, thoughts, and dialogue to reveal a character's personality. Again, that's actions, thoughts, and dialogue. So by examining these things, we will understand the character. So, for example, all right, by saying, um, for the knight, he says he was not gaily dressed. Chaucer suggests that the knight is not vain, all right, that he's honorable, that he takes the higher rope. He's not interested in frivolity. Um, he's not a frivolous person. So, there's an example. I guess a more common example would be, if someone pushed another person off the cliff, the person who pushed someone off the cliff, we would say, that's not a nice person. All right, we're using the actions to demonstrate who the person is. All right, if you say something mean about someone, all right, that's using dialogue. All right. The other thing we need to know is this is a story about a pilgrimage. A uh, pilgrimage is a long annual trip to a holy place, uh, and they're a popular way to express religious devotion. All right, so long religious journey. All right, annual meaning they happen from time to time. Right. Long annual trip to holy places. Good. They're a popular way to express religious devotion. Um, in this case, our pilgrimage all right, is going to be to a specific location. Why? Because someone was murdered there. This person was a martyr. And of course, my question is, who was our martyr? Our martyr was Thomas a Beckett. He was murdered for his religious beliefs, and now the location of his murder is the place where people travel to, to give their respects, and also because they believe in that there might be some holy types of um, healing power. Uh, we see this today with Our Lady of Lourdes, Guadalupe, um, so this is not a necessarily uncommon thing. So a couple questions. When we started looking at the text, my, one of my first questions was, how many people enter? This guy is telling us this story while in that opera, when in April. Our story begins in April, uh, and all of a sudden, this guy is hanging out at the tabard, and all of a sudden, a ton of people come in. So my question, how many people enter the hostel, or the tabard, as it's known? And of course, we find out that it's 29 people. But how many people are actually going on the journey? Now our story slightly changes, all right? Because we have the 29 people, but as of right now, we also have our narrator. So 30 people are going on this journey. And of course, where are they going? It's the title of our story. They are going to Canterbury. And where are they leaving from? They're leaving from London. Again, why Canterbury? Because this is the location of Thomas A. Beckett's murder. Good. All right. In your when you're done memorizing your poem, all right, they say uh, the holy blissful martyr. All right, the holy blissful martyr for Tuseka. All right, they go there to seek the holy blissful martyr. 
All right, that's the whole purpose. Excellent. So let's start by learning about these characters. The first character up is the knight. All right, we have our lovely picture of our knight right here. Now, notice he is introduced first. This is of vital importance. He is our first character. And the question is, why? Well, he's the most noble. All right. He comes from nobility, meaning he's of high rank. He has high social standing. But he also has excellent morals. We also want to take note that he's well-traveled. That's one of the first things that they say. If you have your text, you can open up to page 100. All right. Listen to all the locations he's been. When we took Alexandria, he was there. He often sat at a table in the chair of honor above all nations. When in Prussia, in Lithuania, he had ridden, and Russia, no Christian man so often of his rank. When, in Granada, Algeciras sank under assault, he had been there, and in North Africa, raiding Benamarin. In Anatolio, he had been as well, and fought when Aeus and Italia fell. For all along the Mediterranean coast, he had embarked with many a noble host. All right, so he is extremely well-traveled. We do want to make note, if you turn to around line 70, we'll begin there. And though so much distinguished, he was wise, and in his bearing modest as a maid. He never yet a boorish thing had said, in all his life to any, come what might. He was a true, a perfect, gentle knight. All right. So he's modest. He's not, not showy. All right, continuing on to our next character. We are introduced to the squire. I do like our picture that we have here. Ooh, up for a second. All right, I think that's a good indication. All right, um, we notice a couple things. First off, his hair is of importance. All right, and kind of his thin look, how he looks a little bit more on the dainty side. So let's begin at the bottom of 100 where they begin explaining the squire and they start with leaving off from the night. He had his son with him, a fine young squire, a lover and cadet, a lad of fire, with locks as curly as if they had been pressed. He was some 20 years of age, I guessed. All right, so immediately we find out he is the knight's son. I like that they describe him as a lover, quote unquote. All right, he's good, shall we say, with the ladies. And he has looks to back it up. All right, he's young, approximately 20. Our narrator's not 100% sure. He's just going on looks. And we find out he has curly blonde locks. Notice how they begin to describe him um, in terms of how he deals with women. They say on line 79 and had done valiantly in little space of time and hope to win his lady's grace. All right, so he likes to win his lady's grace. And then notice how they go on to describe him 
maybe his smell, maybe him a little more physically. He was embroidered like a meadow bright, and full of freshest flowers, red and white. Singing he was, or fluting all the day, he was as fresh as is the month of May. All right, so this is a person who's very much concerned with their looks, it appears. Continuing on, short was his gown, the sleeves were long and wide. He knew the way to sit a horse and ride. He could make songs and poems and recite. He knew how to joust and dance, to draw and write. All right, so unlike his father, who's very much a soldier, we find out this guy, all right, likes singing. He likes to write. He likes to dance. Right, he's not your atypical, or he's not your typical type of person. Um, I like to describe him as a glorified pretty boy. your very Heath Ledger type of person. Uh, in fact, Heath Ledger was in a movie called The Knight's Tale, which is about a squire, and this picture would do us quite some appropriate business. All right, just kind of that curly blonde hair, pretty boy kind of look, staring like sultry at you. It's a little bit creepy, I guess, when you start thinking about it. Anyway, very good. So that is the squire. We move on to the yeoman. Uh, I like to, the, this is from the picture exactly in your book. I pulled this right off. All right, we kind of got this picture. A and I thought they did a good job. They indicate some very important things. They note his weapons. All right, so we have a bow. We have arrows. Uh, we have a sword in his back. We have a shield. Uh, they also have his dirk. All right, which is like a little dagger. So they get that right. Um, but I, I feel like his characterization is ever so slightly off uh, in terms of his looks. Um, so I think of him, they say, describe him as wearing green. All right? I think of him far more as a, you know, Robin Hood kind of figure. All right? um, and he was the servant of the squire. So let's note a couple of these things. All right, servant of the squire. Tired of using blue. Servant of the squire. And he likes the color green, or wears green. I shouldn't say he likes it. He's probably wearing green because we find out he's a hunter, right? A forester, as they say. And so green would be a great color for, shall we say, camouflage? All right. We find out that his face is brown like a nut. All right. He's tanned. Um, and this is important because he's out in the sun. All right. So indicate the weapons. That's also important to note. So we have bow, an arrow. All right. We have sword shield, and the dirk. Our next character is the nun, who, or the prioress, really, is what she's referred to, kind of the head nun. Um, I like this picture, although when you kind of blow it up, it kind of looks like she has a beard, but it's a shadow, all right? Um, so let's shrink that back down, put that over there. All right, we find out that the prioress all right, is very educated. That's one of the first things we find out. We can figure out that she speaks three languages, even though the text never indicates it. All right, we understand that she has quite the bit of education. So she speaks three languages. She obviously, of course, speaks English because she lives in England. All right, we find out she speaks French. They make note of that. Oops, misspelled that. And she's a member of the clergy, so more than likely, she speaks Latin, especially since they reference her saying, Amor vincit omnia, all right, which means love conquers all. We find out she's very dainty. 
It's one of your vocabulary words. We also find out she's quite elegant, well-mannered. She has excellent manners, the kind of stuffy person who wipes their lip after every little bite of food. Um, she's also caring. She talks about the dogs, how she would cry if anyone made them, quote, smart, right, which means hits them. Or if she, even if she saw a little mouse, uh, she would cry. I didn't really note the next characters, all right, uh, but the next characters are uh, the second nun and the nun's priest. There's really not too much to say about them because, well, let's read the entire passage together. It starts on the top of 103. Another nun, the chaplain at her cell, was riding with her and a priest as well. And that's the entire text. All right. All we know is that these two people all right, are riding with the prioress. Otherwise, we know nothing of them. The only glimpse we have is of the priest. And that's because he's one of the people who ends up telling a story. The next character is the monk. Um, and the picture works quite well here. So I'm just going to move him over. All right, and we're going to note, physically, they do a good job here. All right, immediately we notice he's bald. We also notice his weight. They describe him, their words, not mine, as fat. Right. And we talked about it in class. Fat is associated with, at this time, wealth. And so that's important to note. Uh, other things to note that we would indicate that show that he is, quote, wealthy. All right. Notice his jacket is fur-lined. And notice his brooch is gold. All right, so he's not a person who's afraid to show his wealth. We find out that he enjoys hunting. And he doesn't follow the Bible in this regards. Uh, this is where we get a little bit of the social commentary. All right. Um, it says, and this is line 180 on page 103, and took the modern world more spacious way. He did not rate that text at a plucked hen, which says that hunters are not holy men. All right, he still believes he's a holy man, despite the fact that he hunts. All right, so I like to indicate that he only believes what he wants to believe in the Bible. Believes what he wants. Excellent. Moving on. Our next character is a friar, and this is really where our social commentary comes in. All right, um, I love this picture. Uh, we know he is a, at least sort of, holy man. All right, he's praying. We notice the cross down here. All right, he sells confessions for money, and this ends up getting the church in quite a lot of trouble. All right, and what is this process called? This process is what's known as absolution. All right, uh, we find out he likes to frequent bars, taverns, inns. Uh, this is important because that's where he's going to find leopards, beggars, that crew. That's literally the language they use. This is line two hundred and. 43 or thereabouts he knew that taverns well he knew the taverns well in every town and every innkeeper and barmaid too better than lepers beggars and that crew all right uh, and why does he like to frequent the bars because where else would be a better place to sell confessions all right what kind of people are you going to find that frequent a bar 
Moving on, all right, we notice his instrument. We find out that he plays all right, the harp. So he plays the harp. But he also plays an instrument known as the, quote, hurdy gurdy. And let me pull up a picture of the hurdy gurdy for you. All right, this is a hurdy gurdy. Notice it has like a crank. Uh, it's sort of like a violin meets guitar kind of thing. All right, but the special thing is it's crank. Um, a not well used instrument nowadays. All right, so we'll toss that up there. All right, tilt that. There we go. All right, cool. Good. Um, other things we find out he likes to sing. We find out he has a lisp, which may be a more attractive thing than would be considered today. All right, and we actually find out his name. He's one of the few characters. His name is Hubert. We're introduced to the merchant, and this might be the worst picture in all of pictures. All right, there's something so wrong with his with his arm. And I really wish I could find a better picture because I really think the characterization is off. The only thing they get right is his boots. Otherwise, I don't really think that's much um, for his hat or the way that he describes their beard. All right, so let's just toss the merchant over there. All right, so first thing we find out, he has a beaver hat. He has a forked beard. All right. One of the beards if Mr. V draws a terrible face. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Let's put a little smile on him. All right, if this is his... Do, do, do. All right. It's one of those, like, crazy forked beards, like it splits in two, alright, so, yes, give him a nice beard, there we go, he, so he has a forked beard, they describe him as having a beaver hat, there we go, alright, and he has dainty buckled boots, which they do indicate on there, alright, and notice that they're dainty, almost like maybe they're, they're girl boots, alright, they also make a note, that he's in debt. He's uh, he's a traitor, so we have to take that at a moment's glance. All right, not one of the more important characters. The Oxford cleric, on the other hand, I think is most certainly one of our important characters here. All right, the Oxford cleric, of course, is a student, and he studies, of course, at Oxford. We find out he's skinny, but in contrast with the monk, all right, it's not because he's poor. In this instance, he's skinny because he spends all his money on a specific thing. And what is that specific thing? He spends all his money on books. All right, he even borrows money from his friends to do what? Spend more money on books. And they note that his horse is very skinny. And why would they note that? Because he spends all his money on books. We find out he's studying philosophy. And he's interested in Aristotle. Important literary term review. If we're rents, or if we're referencing a for famous historical person, what literary term is it? And of course, the answer is it's an illusion. Next up is the sergeant at law, and all we really need to know about him is he's a lawyer. He obviously knows a lot about law. All right, and they note that he has really good grammar, and I think that's a thing worth noting. 
Make sure you know how to spell grammar. That's a good word to know how to spell, and a lot of people spell it wrong, spell it with E-R, but it's actually A-R. The next character is the Franklin. We have this interesting picture, this kind of Santa Claus creepy figure going on in the bottom right, but they get that correct, all right? They, first thing they note is he has a white beard. All right, Franklin is not his name. All right, that's his profession. And his profession is a wealthy landowner. But what he likes to do is throw parties. All right. He loves food. He loves games. He loves parties. Note, if you turn to page 107... A couple lines down, they begin describing how much he loves food and wine and festivities. He made, this is line 350, he made his household free to all the county. His bread, his ale were the finest of the fine, and no one had a better stock of wine. His house was never short of baked meat pies, of fish and flesh, and these in such supplies it positively snowed with meat and drink, and all the dainties that a man could think. All right, so he really likes to, to host things, all right, to party. The Guild is our next group, right? The Guild is really the introduction of our working class. We're introduced to the haberdasher. A haberdasher is a person who makes men's clothing. A dyer dyes clothes. The carpenter clothes. That's great. Dyes clothes. Change that to clothing. We'll be symmetrical in our syntax. All right. Carpenter makes furniture. Our weaver makes basket and bags. And our carpet maker makes carpets. That's all you need to know about the guild. All right? They don't really stress what they what their interaction is. All right? But they're important nevertheless. Not part of the guild, but clearly working class is the cook. We find out that the cook is good at tasting ale. which is beer. Good. Tasting beer. Alright, we find out um, that he has an ulcer on his knee, which our picture lovely indicates. We should note his profession, which is he's a cook. It's important. All right, and he makes really good blancmange. You should know what blancmange is because it's a traditional English dish. All right, it's just like a creamy chicken. All right, creamy chicken. Our next character is the skipper. Our skipper, of course, is a captain. They note that he has a hard time riding a horse. He finds it difficult. And we can figure this is because he is or has sea legs. We also notice his morality. He they, tells people to walk the plank from time to time. And they make note of the name of his boat. And it seems like a throwaway, but maybe, just maybe, that would be something he talks about in one of his stories. Alright, his boat's name is... The Maudelaine.
Okay, so, sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to add in the character that we were going to talk about, which all right, sometimes known as the physician. And in class we discussed the four humors, so you want to make sure you know what the four humors are. And this was a way of healing people. So, I would use yellow, but you wouldn't be able to see it. The first humor is yellow. It's associated with summer. And associated with urine. Alright, this is for mild sicknesses. People who are easily angered or bad-tempered. Alright, and so, removing urine would hopefully cure them of this. The next is green, associated with winter, and associated with phlegm. This is for more serious sicknesses, uh, associated with like your brain, or possibly, more than likely, your lungs. All right. Those who are more seriously sick, or those who are like calm, unemotional. Um, good. Our next more serious color is black. Black is associated with autumn. and associated with bile. Those who were more depressed, um, despondent, sleepless, irritable, all right, they would find a way to remove bile, laxatives, uh, and cure them of that. And of course the final is red. Associated with spring, associated with blood, the curing of which would be le leeches. This is a far more dangerous, associated with liver, cancer, those kind of things. All right. All right. That's what you definitely need to know about the doctor. Um, so, good. The final character is the wife of Bath. Uh, she is the worthy woman of Bath City. All right, I love this picture. I think it's an excellent portrayal of her. Um, I've seen other pictures that portray her in different ways. All right, she wears red. It's important. It's a color associated with, dare we say, prostitution. I think that's important, um, especially since they indicate that she has gapped teeth, which we talked about in class. All right. We know gap teeth meant she was good at many things. All right, uh, and they note that she is good at quote dancing. Uh, we also find out that she had five husbands. All right, so and it's not because she divorced her husbands. So how did she manage five husbands? She married old. And as we kindly pointed out in class, when we add up all these things, what is she? Well, she's really a gold digger. Good. All right, so those are the characters that we're going through now. All right, I'll make another podcast shortly thereafter. All right, starting with the parson and finishing through. All right, hopefully you found this helpful. Uh, continue to review, practice your Canterbury tale, uh, and I will also make a separate podcast for the uh, first 18 lines in Middle English. Thanks for listening, and remember, the more views, the more likes, the happier I am, uh, and feel free to leave comments on what you thought. Thanks, guys.